If you hadn't already figured it out, part of our discussion last class, toward the end of our time together, was looking at one specific aspect of racial inequality in the United States today, as seen through the criminal justice system. In class, we're going to look at some other ways in which racially uneven outcomes occur, all of which are rooted in the operation of various social institutions. Then on the following class, we'll do the same thing with an eye toward uneven outcomes along the lines of gender. In the videos for this week, my goal is to do two things. First, while both class sessions focus on a singular axis of experience, race followed by gender, I want to use the videos to take a more intersectional approach. That is, I want to think about some of the ways in which inequality along the lines of race and gender don't exist in isolation from each other, and also don't exist in isolation from other forms of inequality. If you think about your own life, this probably isn't too hard to understand. All of us have a race and a gender, and a host of other identity markers too, such as our political and religious affiliations, our sexual identities, our ability status, and whatnot. Though each of these might take on more meaning at some points in our lives than at others, it's not like we ever stop experiencing our gender or our race. But second, I want to look at some concepts that are clearly linked to social inequality, but don't neatly fit into a 75-minute discussion of the social structural contours of inequality. So for today's video, I'm going to overview what is in many ways the inverse of inequality, and then in our next video, I'll talk some about how inequalities can manifest at the interpersonal level. So what do I mean by the inverse of inequality? Well, the definition of an uneven experience is that if some group or person is being disadvantaged, then another group or person is being advantaged. We typically understand that experience of disadvantage as being an inequality. As such, the advantage might be thought of as a privilege. Now the word privilege is one that gets thrown around in a lot of different ways. So I think it's important to start with a really clear definition. We can define privilege as a set of unearned and often invisible advantages, opportunities, and or benefits accrued to members of one group as a consequence of their group membership. Privileges can occur on multiple dimensions, race, gender, class, and a host of other factors, and we typically call them things like white privilege or male privilege or a variety of related kinds of terms. These privileges range from the very mundane and perhaps even seemingly trivial to the incredibly profound, and they are upheld by both cultural and structural forces. Here's an example from the macro level. Consider the fact that in the United States, white males make up only about a third of the population but they occupy 80% of tenured positions in higher education, 80% of the House of Representatives and Senate, 92% of Forbes 400 executive CEO positions, 90% of public school superintendents, nearly all athletic team owners, and 98% of all US presidents to date. Note that privilege is not something that people who receive it actively do on purpose. It exists regardless of a person's particular attitudes. It's not like someone says, I'm going to go out and engage in some privilege today. This isn't a question of individual choice, but is conferred upon us by our group memberships. It is what we might call an ascribed characteristic. Part of what characterizes privilege is that these advantages and benefits are not only unearned, they are often invisible to us. So what are some of the things that make privilege invisible to us? Well, there are four key factors. First, as I've emphasized in some of the slides so far, we often individualize inequality and oppression. We think of people who are racist, who are sexist, or who are homophobic, rather than the systems that allow these ills to exist in the first place. Calling someone a racist, for example, individualizes the behavior and veils the fact that racism can only occur where it is culturally, socially, and legally supported in some way. This is especially noticeable along the lines of race, as white people especially are typically much more concerned with not being given the label of racist 
than with worrying about the systemic racism that exists and how we might go about changing it. Second, we think of these various identities of experience along the lines of race, class, gender, etc. as being equally situated. We assume, for example, that these categories consist of neutral halves, each part a mirror of the other, such that black is effectively equivalent to white, man effectively equivalent to woman, gay effectively equivalent to straight, and so forth and so on. But the parts that make up these pairings are not equivalently situated. There are advantaged and disadvantaged groups, as we're talking about in class this week. Third, it is possible to be privileged in some respects and disadvantaged in others. We're not talking about an all or nothing affair. Someone subordinated under one form of oppression may be advantaged under a different form of oppression. Consider, for example, white women. White women may experience a disadvantage along the dynamics of gender, even while they experience privilege along the dimension of their race. Or consider working class white men. Now we're really getting complicated, right? They experience the dual privileges of race and gender, even while experiencing disadvantage along the lines of class. And they may often think things like, well, I don't have privilege. I've had to work for everything I have. And in some senses, they're right. Economically, they probably have had to work hard for where they are in life. But that doesn't erase the fact that they do experience certain kinds of privilege in other ways, even if it's not immediately recognizable to them. So it might be more useful to think of fields of privilege and oppression and how those fields intersect with one another in their operation rather than thinking of this in absolutist sorts of terms. And finally, just because someone benefits from privilege does not mean that they actively perpetuate inequality. They are still connected to its operation, but what's important to note here is that you can receive a certain kind of privilege without being someone who does things to further exacerbate the inequalities that underlie that system. Our vocabulary hides the existence of specific identifiable beneficiaries of oppression, particularly those who are not necessarily active perpetrators of discrimination. In short, to put it simply, one doesn't have to be a racist or hold racist views or even do racist things in order to benefit from racial privilege. Those things can occur simultaneously. Privilege is, in this way, systemic. Nonetheless, those who so benefit are still connected to these uneven phenomena in that the privileged do have the choice of whether to struggle against oppression or to remain silent in the face of it. There's not a social cost to doing so. For those who do not experience a certain dimension of privilege, the stakes involved in making such a choice are far, far different. Remaining silent has material consequences, just as speaking up has material consequences. Thus is the nature of privilege. One final caveat. The point in having this discussion is not to make people feel guilty or defensive over the privileges they have in life. As I said before, it's not about choice. It's not like one can just say, I renounce my privilege, and suddenly it become true. So if you're feeling guilty, or if you're feeling defensiveness, or something along those lines, let me suggest that it might be more productive to feel anger. And in particular, anger at an oppressive system that allows these things to exist in the first place. Taken this way, the point of thinking about privilege is to help us recognize the role that privilege plays in perpetuating inequality so that all of us, the privileged and the disadvantaged alike, can look for ways to remediate inequality. In our next class, we'll turn to these more systemic aspects of inequality, specifically as they relate to race. This is generally referred to as what we call institutional or systemic racism. We'll look at a variety of different examples and spend some time thinking about why such uneven outcomes occur.